بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله and welcome to this podcast series of a commentary on نهج البلاغة brought to you by Mizan Institute Khutbah number one of نهج البلاغة is a very famous khutbah the first lines of which usually are used in Friday sermons a khutbah that encompasses many of the Islamic beliefs that we have. It talks about different topics in that regard. I just want to share with you a short list of some of those topics that will be discussed in this khutbah. For example, Allah's qualities, Allah's traits and characteristics are discussed in the beginning of this khutbah. So that has to do with tawheed. And then he moves on to the creation of the universe, and in particular the creation of the skies, the earth. Then he moves on to the creation of the angels, and then on to the creation of Prophet Adam salam, and the whole story of the prostration of the angels to Prophet Adam, and the objection of Iblis, and then finally the dissension of Prophet Adam salam to earth. The khutbah goes on to speak of the prophets in general, and them being chosen as prophets, and the reason for why they were made prophets, and then the prophethood of our holy prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi, and then the greatness of the Quran and its significance, and the importance of the Sunnah of the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi. and then finally he also speaks about out of the furu'ud din, those uh, branches of the faith, he speaks of Hajj, and the importance of Hajj and discussions in that regard. That is an overview of this khutbah. And so let us begin with the first part or the first section of this khutbah that has to do with God, it has to do with theology, which theology means the study of God and you know the characteristics and traits and qualities of God. So there are about 12 qualities of God that are discussed in the first part of this khutbah that have to do with that has to do with Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Out of these 12 qualities of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala, the first 3 are speaking of how no one can ever praise Allah and fulfill the praise of Allah the way he deserves. The second set of qualities, which is two of them, the Imam he speaks about how it's not even possible to understand the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be able to describe him. Then the next four qualities that are discussed in this section of the khutbah are speaking about how the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just infinite. And there's no way that one can understand and wrap their head around it. So in other words, it's as if like, if we can't praise him properly, it's not our fault, it's because he's just so great. And then finally, the last three traits and qualities of Allah that are discussed, they have to do with him and his creation. And just illustrating that he is so great and how we know he's so great through his creation. Because sometimes you can understand the greatness of someone by just looking at their essence. Sometimes you look at how great what has emanated from them, what has come into existence from them. Look at how great that is, and then you can understand and deduce from that how great the one who created and the creator is. So that'll be 12 traits, 12 qualities of Allah that are discussed in the beginning of this khutbah. And so the khutbah begins, Alhamdulillah alladhi la yablughu midhatahu al-qailun. All praise is due to Allah, the one who, the praise of those who want to utter his praise, the ones who speak. Al-qailun means anyone who says anything. But in this context, it means those who are trying to praise him. The one who, the praise of those who want to praise him can never reach what it's supposed to, the point it's supposed to. They are trying to reach his ultimate praise and fulfill the praise of God, but they will never be able to. Whoever tries to praise Allah the way he deserves to be praised will fail in doing so, in other words. Alhamdulillah la This reminds us of a famous hadith by the Holy Prophet where he says, when he's speaking to Allah, he says that, O oh Allah, ma arafnaka haqqa ma'rifatik. That, O oh Allah, we have not been able to have ma'rifah of you, understand you, have 
cog proper cognition of you the way you deserve. In other words, we have not been able to grasp you for what you are really. And so when you read this line, you get this feeling that, okay, this there is a tone here that the Prophet has as if this is something that is expected of us, as if the Prophet is scolding himself and everyone else because they have not been able to gain the proper ma'rifah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way he deserves. So a question here begs to be asked, and that is, wait a minute, why is the Prophet upset about this when something like this might not even be possible? The question is, is that even something that is expected of us? To have a proper ma'rifah of Allah the way he deserves, because that's impossible. And so the answer to this is probably that these types of statements, these types of lines that we find by the Imams or by the Holy Prophet are maybe to remind us, to remind us of how we should never become arrogant and think that, okay, my I'm a philosopher, for example, I'm a theologian, I'm a person who recites the Quran every day throughout the day. You know, I have a good understanding of the tafsir of Quran. So as a result, I have a proper ma'rifah and understanding of God. Statements like these, lines like these, sit us down and put us in our place and remind us that if the Prophet ﷺ is saying this about himself even, then who am I as a scholar, as a theologian, as a lecturer, as whatever it is, to think that I have understood God the way he really is and the way he deserves. And so... I would say that this is not an expectation of us to have a ma'rifah of Allah that He is deserving of because that's not even possible. But there is something important here to remember and that is that in the Qur'an we have something else regarding Allah that is said and that is expected of us that we're supposed to do in regards to Allah the way He deserves. If the Prophet ﷺ, he says, ma that we, O oh Allah, do not have a ma'rifah of you the way you deserve. And then we say that, okay, but this is not something to expect anyway, but there is something out there that will be close to this that is expected and is possible, one can say. And that has to do with a verse of the Qur'an. Verse 102 of Surah Ali Imran. It says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, اِتَّقُوا اللَّهَ حَقَّ تُقَاتِهِ وَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ That, O oh, you who believe, have taqwa of Allah, beware of Allah, be wary of Allah. Have the taqwa. Taqwa usually, it'll have different equivalents that people like to use. Some will call it god wariness. Some will, some will say to be God-conscious. Some will say to have fear of God. All in all, brothers and sisters, this is something that I always say. Whatever you take the equivalent to be, the more taqwa a person has, practically speaking, the less they will disobey God. This is something that our scholars explain. This is something that's common sense. When you fear someone, when you're more conscious of someone, what will you do? You'll be more careful not to do something to make them upset, correct? And so when we say you have to have taqwa of Allah, practically for us what that means is that we are going to follow his commands, follow his wajib and haram and observe those as much as possible. The more we follow his commands and observe them, the more taqwa we have. This verse of the Qur'an, it says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اِتَّقُوا اللَّهَ حَقَّ تُقَاتِهِ Have taqwa of Allah the way he deserves for you to have taqwa towards him. In other words, you have to try your best to be as obedient a servant as you can towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's interesting how this expectation is there because the Qur'an is saying it. But then when we, have, when we talk about the ma'rifah of Allah, the Holy Prophet says, ma arafnaka haqqa ma'rifatik. Well, if the Prophet can't have it, then that means it's impossible for us to have it. But when it comes to our actions, when it comes to observances, the Qur'an is, has, is letting us know there is an expectation. It says, live up to the taqwa of Allah the way He deserves. I would say that means, what that means for us is that we need to try our best to be as observant of servants we can be. To try our best to reach a point where we, we have taqwa towards all the wajib and haram of Allah to, until a point, inshallah, that we are obedient to Allah 100%. And that is possible. 
Someone might say, well, that's that means we have to be infallible. No, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to be infallible. Some A person can also sometimes make mistakes, but then they do tawbah. Tawbah is part of taqwa. Anyway, this is a long story and it's not um, relevant to the khutbah itself. This is just something on the side that I wanted to mention in regards to that line by the Holy Prophet, ma'arafnaka haqqa ma'rifatik, that we have a verse in the Quran that has the same wording, and it, as a result, we feel that we can say that there is an expectation for us to uh, live up to the taqwa of Allah. But the ma'rifah of Allah, if the Prophet can't have it, then what's for sure is that uh, we won't be able to have it either. And if the Prophet is saying that I don't have it, what we can say is that um, it's not going to be possible for us. Okay, let's go back to what we were talking about. If the Holy Prophet ﷺ, he says, Oh Allah, we will never or we were not able to understand you, have cognition of you the way you deserve, then that's when this line of Nahj al makes more sense. Imam Ali السلام, he says, Alhamdulillah, la yablughu midhatahu al All praises due to the one who, those who even try to praise God, will never be able to do it properly the way he deserves. Why is that the case? Because of what the Prophet said. He said, We can never gain the ma'rifah that we're supposed to towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, if you can't gain ma'rifah of Allah the way he deserves, then as a result, you won't be able to praise him the way he deserves. Because we have to understand, to praise something properly means that you have to have an understanding of all of the praiseworthy aspects of that thing. If we can never have proper ma'rifah of Allah, that means actually we can never have proper madh or hamd of Allah, proper praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this brings me to two hadiths that I want to share with you that are relevant to this idea of not being able to fulfill anything that has to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly. Number one, this first hadith is by Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam. It says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He revealed unto Musa alayhi salam that, O Musa, I want you to fulfill my gratitude, my shukr, the way I deserve. So look at what the Prophet, he says, Prophet Musa alayhi salam. He says, O Allah, how am I supposed to do that when I know if I ever try to show my gratitude to you, show my shukr to you, anytime I get the opportunity to thank you for whatever you've given me, this thankfulness itself is a blessing by you. This is like deep stuff, brothers and sisters. Prophet Musa says, how can I thank you? I have come to this understanding that I'll never be able to thank you properly. A reason for that is because I know that even thankfulness itself is from you and I should be thankful for that thankfulness. And so it'll just infinitely regress to say, I want to be thankful to Allah, but if I'm going to be thankful to Him, I have to be thankful for being thankful to Him. But then again, I have to be thankful for being thankful for being thankful to Him. And it just goes on. So how am I even going to be thankful to you, O Allah, in a way that I've properly showed my thankfulness to you. It's not possible the way you deserve. You see, brothers and sisters, we had that line by the Holy Prophet Muhammad He said, ma arafnaka haqqa ma'rifatik. It's not even possible for me to have a proper ma'rifah of you. And so we said, then we can't have a proper praise of Allah. Here, Prophet Musa is saying, I can't even be properly thankful, O Allah, because that would mean that I would have to be thankful for my thankfulness. And then it would just keep going on and on like that. And so what is Prophet Musa doing here? The one thing he is doing is that he's acknowledging that, Oh Allah, I can never do that. You're telling me to be properly thankful of you the way you deserve? I can never do that. And so Allah says, Ya Musa, according to the hadith, Imam Sadiq, he tells us, he says that Allah then said, Ya Musa, al-ana shakartani, hina alimta anna dhalika minni. O Musa, now you have actually lived up to the shukr, the thankfulness that I expect of you. When you knew that even thankfulness itself comes from me. Subhanallah. So what I'm trying to illustrate here, brothers and sisters, is that all in all, we have to always understand that we will never be able to do it the way it's supposed to be done, the way Allah deserves for it to be done. Or for example, we have that famous hadith in which it says that Imam Al-Kadhim salam he said to one of his sons, لِبَعْضِ وُلِّهِ that يَا بُنَيَّ عَلَيْكَ بِالْجِدِّ 
لا تخرجن نفسك عن حد التقصير في عبادة الله فإن الله لا يعبد حق عبادته that Imam Al-Kadhim told one of his sons or maybe some of his sons that, oh my son, when it comes to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't you ever think that you've done a good job there. You're always going to be falling short of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly. Why? Because Allah can never be worshipped the way He deserves. So why is the Imam even telling his son this? Well, I want to say that when we acknowledge that my ibadah is nowhere close to what it's supposed to be, it seems that that's when Allah actually accepts it from us. The same way He accepted Prophet Musa's shukr when Prophet Musa said, I can't even fulfill the thankfulness that I'm supposed to. So when it comes to the ibadah of Allah, when it comes to the shukr of Allah, when it comes to ma'rifah of Allah, when it comes to hamd of Allah, when it comes to all these things, what we need to understand is that, oh Allah, and, and really admit to Allah, is that, oh Allah, I just can't do it the way you deserve. Please accept from me whatever I have to offer you. And finally, the second hadith that I want to share with you before I end, which is also an interesting hadith and it, I think it has a message for us. That It says that uh, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he came out of the masjid once and he had lost his ride, whatever it was. Was it a camel? Was it a horse? Was it a mule? Let's just assume it was a mule or something, okay? So he says, and he says out loud, the people hear him, he says, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returns my ride to me, my, let's say, mule to me, I will thank him the way he deserves to be thanked. And so after a while, they find the mule, and he says, Alhamdulillah. So everyone's like waiting to see what he's going to say. And he says, Alhamdulillah. And so the people are like, we thought you're going to do something very big. Is this all? Like you said you're going to do it the way God deserves. And the Imam, he says, well, didn't you hear me say, Alhamdulillah? And so, what's going on here? <laughs> well, what, what can be said in, the, in regards to this hadith here is that the Imam understands that he can't praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for everything, thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for everything that Allah has done and everything that Allah deserves. And so, what does the Imam say in, in, instead? What he says is, Alhamdulillah, which means all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the best we can do really. The best we can do, the way to say it according to these hadiths, according to the Quran even, Surah Fatiha says it, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, that we just at least say all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, Imam al-Sadiq Imam al alayhi salam, when he says Alhamdulillah, he has, according to our Shi'i mainstream belief, he has all the ma'rifah a human being can have of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's gonna, when he says Alhamdulillah, he is taking into consideration all of the ma'rifah of Allah that a human being can have. And as a result of that, he is saying Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah, all thanks is due to Allah. Now a person like me will say Alhamdulillah, I have a very, very, very limited understanding of Allah and the greatness of Allah and the re different reasons why Allah deserves thankfulness and praise. So if I say it, it's going to be a flawed, alhamdulillah. But when the imam says it, of course, it's going to be the most complete form of that. But at the same time, at the same time, Imam Ali in Nahj al-Balagha, he's saying, alhamdulillah, alladhi la yablughu midhatahu al-qailun. No matter how much we try though, at the end of the day, we will never be able to reach that point. Even the Holy Prophet sallallahu is admitting that, oh Allah, the way you actually deserve is not going to happen. But yes, Imam al-Sadiq is letting us know in this hadith that if anyone's going to get it right and going to get as close as they can to what it is to get it right, it is going to be the ma'sumin, the infallibles. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.